Oba Chandler was an American serial rapist and a notorious murderer who was convicted and executed via lethal injection for the horrendous killings of Joan Rogers and her two daughters whose bodies were found in Tampa Bay, Florida. On June 4th, the three women, Joan, Christy, and Michelle, were found floating in the bay with their hands tied and feet bound. The decomposition process had produced gases that caused the bodies to rise to the surface, pulling up the concrete blocks tied to their necks and duct tape over their mouths. Further analysis revealed that the woman had been thrown into the water alive. The gruesome murder became highly intriguing in 1992 when local police began investigating. For months, the detectives investigating the murder of the three women were not having much luck in tracking down their killer. Frustrated and drying up on leads, the police posted billboards bearing enlarged images of the suspect's handwriting recovered from a pamphlet in the victim's car. So how was Oba Chandler eventually caught after three years of nothing? Do you feel that Chandler's early life crimes, such as possessing counterfeit money, loitering, armed robbery, burglary, and kidnapping caught up with him? What were his last words before being executed by lethal injection? We'll unravel everything here, but before we do, please kindly subscribe and turn on the notification bell for more fascinating true crime videos. Oba Chandler was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio, approximately 100 miles from the Rogers house. Chandler was the fourth of five children to Oba Chandler Sr. and Margaret Johnson. In his tween years, in June 1957, Oba's father died by hanging himself in the basement of the family's apartment. Chandler wept uncontrollably. He reportedly jumped into the open grave at the funeral as the gravediggers were covering the coffin with dirt. A few years following his father's death, Chandler had been possessed by a demon. By age 14, he had been arrested 20 times as a juvenile for various crimes, including stealing cars and kidnapping, amongst others. Chandler showed no signs of changing his ways until he turned 18 and was charged. Chandler was accused of peeping through an unclothed woman's window to masturbate and breaking into people's homes to steal. During his early days in Florida, Chandler and an accomplice whisked a couple to a corner, tied the man, took the woman into the bedroom, and forced her to strip down to her underwear. After stripping her naked, Chandler then tied her up and slowly rubbed the barrel of his revolver across her stomach. It was evident that Chandler derived sexual pleasure from scaring people. On May 14, 1988, Chandler married Deborah Whiteman, and she gave birth to the couple's daughter Whitney in February 1989. The family lived happily as Chandler's aluminum business, Custom Screens, soared. A few months later, Chandler bought a house at 10,790 Dalton Avenue in Tampa, plus a blue and white 21-foot Bayliner boat with which he developed a new sense of freedom. This boat presented an opportunity to fulfill his favorite pastime, hanging around women. Chandler had no problem luring beautiful women onto his boat for sunset cruises in the Tampa Bay area. On May 14, 1989, Chandler met two young Canadian tourists, Judy Blair and Barbara Mottram, at a 7-Eleven in Madera Beach, Florida. Chandler lied to the two tourists that his name was Dave Posno, or Posner, and he owned an aluminum company in Bradenton. The women were impressed with his achievements and joined him on a pleasant boat ride the next morning. The next day, one of the tourists, Judy, showed up for another delightful cruise. Chandler then began touching and hugging Judy as they cruised, trying to lock lips with her and telling her he wanted to make love. When Judy declined, he became aggressive. Is sex worth losing your life over? Chandler said as he pinned Judy down and raped her on the boat floor. The next morning, Judy reported the rape to Madera Beach Police. Unfortunately, Chandler couldn't be pinned for the crime since there was no forensic evidence to back Judy's claim. But she was able to give a detailed description of her attacker and what he did to her. Only a few months later, Chandler struck again. 
Joan Rogers and her two daughters, Michelle, 17, and Christy, 14, left their family dairy farm in Wilshire, Ohio for a vacation in Florida when they encountered their killer. It was the first time that the Rogers family had left their home state, so they were lost finding their hotel, and that was when they stumbled upon Chandler and instantly grew rejuvenated. Chandler wrote down directions to the woman's hotel and a brochure and invited them for a sunset cruise on his boat that evening on Tampa Bay. The Rogers family turned up as planned and they cruised on. Once they had gotten far into the bay, Chandler then tied their wrists behind their backs with yellow rope and put duct tape over their mouths. The partially dressed state of the three bodies indicated that Chandler may have sexually assaulted them before he tied a rope around each of their necks. On the end of each rope was a 30 pound concrete block to ensure that the woman had died from either suffocation or drowning and that their bodies would never be found. Then he cast each of them into the water while they were still alive. On June 4th, 1989, the three bodies were found floating in Tampa Bay. Police found the first body on a sailboat crossing under the Sunshine Skyway. The Coast Guard recovered the second body off the pier in St. Petersburg, and the third was found floating 200 yards to the east. Dental records helped identify the bodies as Michelle, Christy, and Joan Rogers from Wilshire. The police were shocked to see that the three bodies were found floating face down, bound with a rope around their necks, and naked below the waist. Autopsy showed that the three bodies had water in their lungs, proving that they'd been thrown into the water while alive. And that's not all. There were also indications of rape amongst others. A month or so into the investigation, the case remained unscratched, despite tons of tips received by the police. The most valuable tip was when Jim Kappel, the lead detective on the case, came across the Madera Beach Monthly Bulletin put out by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, which described a similar rape of a 24-year-old Canadian tourist named Judy. This piece of information would eventually change everything. The similarities between the two cases struck the detective. The fact that the first had occurred two weeks before the Rogers murders made it more intriguing. Kappel tried to link the Dave Posner, or Posner character, but couldn't find anyone in the Tampa Bay area by that name. So Kappel and another detective took a trip to Canada to interview the tourists Judy Blair and Barbara Mottram, described in the bulletin. Judy explained everything to Kappel, as well as the description of her rapist, which was used to create a composite sketch. While the investigation was still ongoing and hundreds of tips poured in from the public regarding the man in the composite sketch, Chandler became increasingly agitated and began lashing out at his family. Frustrated and out of cash to fly out of town, he became an informant for the U.S. Customs and the Tampa Police Department from May to September 1991. Finally, on September 24, 1992, Chandler was arrested. The primary clue that led to his arrest was a brochure with handwritten directions to a hotel found in Joan Rogers' car, which forensic analysis showed wasn't written by any members of the Rogers family. With few other options left, the local police had thought about posting the images of the handwriting on the brochure on billboards in the Tampa Bay area. In May of 1992, a woman contacted the St. Petersburg Police Department, telling them that she recognized the handwriting as that of a contractor she had hired. His name was Oba Chandler. Interestingly, the use of billboards by law enforcement in the U.S. was unusual at the time. The sweetest part was that the woman still had the receipt of business that she did with Chandler, and it was, without a doubt, the same handwriting. On September 24th, 1992, Oba Chandler was arrested at an Interstate 75 gas station near his home in Volusia County, Florida. During his trial in Clearwater, Florida, Chandler agreed that he met the Rogers family and gave them directions, but that he never saw them again except in newspaper coverage and billboards. 
Chandler also acknowledged that he had been at Tampa Bay that horrific night, but that he was alone struggling with his boat that had gas leakage since the Coast Guard and the Florida Marine Patrol were too busy to help. He said he subsequently fixed the line with duct tape and returned safely to shore. Unfortunately for Chandler, a boat mechanic who testified for the prosecution explained that Chandler's alleged gas leak was not possible because the fuel lines in his boat, a bay liner, were directed upward. Judy, the Canadian tourist, also testified that Chandler had raped her and then returned her to shore a few weeks before the brutal murder. On November 4th, 1994, Chandler was convicted of the murders and was sentenced to death. Shortly after the trial and conviction, his wife Deborah filed for divorce, and their marriage was dissolved a year later. Governor Rick Scott signed Chandler's death warrant on October 10th, 2011, and on November 15th, Chandler was executed by lethal injection at Florida State Prison in Rayford. He refused to say a word, but left a note. You are killing an innocent man today. Do you think that Oba Chandler was telling the truth in his written note? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.